Imagine Hubble's excitement when, and this is Edwin Hubble, the person, not Hubble, the space telescope who's named after the person, 100 years ago, discovering that we live in an expanding universe. Although, I have to take a step back. He didn't really see an expanding universe. Instead, he saw evidence for an expanding universe. He collected a set of data, an amazing set of data, that we can only interpret, the only viable interpretation that's left standing of that evidence, of that data, is that we live in an expanding universe. And what he saw, it's not like he actually saw like the universe getting bigger day by day. That'd be a little bit weird and a little bit challenging. Instead, he saw redshift. He saw light from distant galaxies shifted redder. And it was just a few years before that he had already made one landmark discovery, which was the fact that other galaxies are kind of a thing, that there are these spiral nebula in the sky. Turns out those aren't nebula at all. They're their own distinct island universes, aka galaxies, that sit ridiculously far away from the Milky Way galaxy. And it was follow-up measurements based on data that other people had taken, plus his own measurements, where he saw that the light from almost all these galaxies was being shifted, where in this, this technique that he used, this technique that he used, I want to make a little sidetrack here. The technique that he used to discover redshift is based on spectral lines, and that method already was, I don't know, like 50, 60, 70 years old, where if you can identify an element, if you're looking at the light from an object, like a blade of grass or a barn or the sun or a nebula or a distant galaxy, it's emitting light of all sorts of wavelengths, all sorts of different colors. And some elements in that cloud of gas, in that blade of grass, or whatever, some elements, some molecules, will preferentially emit very specific wavelengths of light. It's like a fingerprint pattern. It's a fingerprint pattern for, uh, for a particular element. And you can identify, like, oh, I see light of this wavelength, that one, that one, that one. Oh, man, that's hydrogen. That's, that's like, that's the fingerprint of hydrogen, nailed it, there's hydrogen in that cloud of gas. Or there's chlorophyll in that blade of grass. It's, it's a fingerprint for every single element and every single molecule. And you can compare, you can look at the light emitted by, say, a hot ball of glowing hydrogen in the laboratory. You can say, oh, this is the, the, the what we call the spectrum, the spectral fingerprint of hydrogen. And then you can go out in the universe and you can look at the sun, you can look at other stars, and you see that exact same fingerprint here and there. And you're like, oh, wow, there's hydrogen uh, in the sun. There's hydrogen in that cloud of gas, whatever. But sometimes you see the exact same fingerprint, but shifted to one side or the other. Maybe it's all the exact same pattern, but everything's a few wavelengths higher or a few wavelengths lower. It's shifted towards the blue or shifted towards the red. And we interpret this as a Doppler redshift. The same Doppler effect that gives you, you know, that classic ambulance sound that like, and I'm actually kind of impressed I was able to do that in one shot. That same Doppler effect you get in sound, you can get in light, where if something is moving, it will shift the wavelength of that light. So if the star, for example, is moving towards us, we'll see that spectral fingerprint, we'll see that, say, the lines of hydrogen, we'll see it shifted towards the blue, towards higher energy wavelengths. And if the star is moving away from us, it's shifted towards the red. We can use this to measure the speed of objects in space. Not the total speed, like we can't get a sense of the left, right, or up, down speed. We get a sense of the in, out speed like this, which is uh, good enough. So we, by the time Edwin Hubble did this in the early 20th century, we'd already been doing it a lot with stars, and this is how we were able to map out the motions of stars in our galactic neighborhood. And there were a few others, including Hubble himself, that started applying this to the distant nebula, which were now identified as galaxies. 
Some of the galaxies, like Andromeda, were found to be coming right for us, and Andromeda is indeed on a collision course with the Milky Way galaxy. But as he got further out, so Andromeda's our nearest neighbor, as he went out to further and further galaxies, they all seem to be receding away from us. They all seem to be redshifted. And there's more. It's not just that galaxies were moving away from us, but they were moving away from us in a very peculiar pattern. The further out the galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from us. So a galaxy at a certain distance was moving a certain speed. A galaxy that was twice as far away was moving twice as fast as away, away from us. A galaxy that was four times further away from us was moving four times further away, faster away, and so on and so on. So there's this weird pattern where there was a relationship between the distance a galaxy is from us and the speed at which it was receding from us. Now, that's just, that's the raw data. So that is Hubble's result, right, of this analysis, this relationship between speed and distance. What could it be? Like, like, like let's go down the list and see what could explain this very interesting result. Number one, it could be, could be a conspiracy. Mm, yeah. A conspiracy, yeah. All the galaxies in the universe are conspiring. They know all know where the Milky Way galaxy is, where, where we live, and the close ones are going to move away from us at a little bit of speed, and the further wave ones are going to move away from a lot of speed, and they're all going to coordinate and talk to each other to make sure that all lines up just right. Probably not likely, right? How does a distant galaxy, hundreds of billions of light years away or whatever, know about us. It doesn't. All right. So conspiracy, not likely. What if it's, uh, what if it's dust? What if this strange redshift effect where the spectral lines that we identify because of some element in that galaxy is getting shifted towards the red? What if that light isn't due to motion? What if that shift isn't due to motion? But what if that light between us and that distant galaxy, there's a whole bunch of dust and the dust is doing funny things to the light? Well, that would kind of make sense, but we know what dust does. We've seen the effects of dust in our own galaxy. It preferentially shifts some colors over other colors. It introduces polarizations. It... it and we've done measurements. Like we can look in the direction of the Andromeda galaxy or an even more distant galaxy, and there isn't a lot of dust out there. And it doesn't matter if we're looking through the plane of the Milky Way or perpendicular to the plane of the Milky Way. It's exactly the same in all directions. And dust uh, it tends to be clumpy. Dust, dust is clumpy in with the galaxies themselves. So dust at first blush seems plausible, but dust isn't doing things to the light that we see the light doing. Like we're seeing light from these distant galaxies get uniformly shifted towards the red, not just a piece of it towards the red and then other part is unaffected, which is what dust would do. So dust doesn't seem plausible. Maybe, maybe there's some new physics here. Maybe light gets, uh, gets tired or something. Like, like light just, you know, it travels at the speed of light all around Earth and the solar system. But once you get to extra galactic distances, it's, it's running, it's running. It's just kind of like, nah, 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 I just give up. I just give up. This tired light idea is at first kind of interesting, except in this case, we turn to what we know about special relativity. In this case, we turn to what we know about electromagnetism, Maxwell's laws. There's nothing in Maxwell's laws that says light just kind of gives up energy. In special relativity, which is built off of Maxwell's equations at a fundamental level, uh, says nothing about light. Light is just light. Light goes at the speed of light and who cares? It doesn't care about anybody. And so if you want to say maybe light gets tired on its journey from a distant galaxy to our own, it's going to break special relativity. And special relativity is super ridiculously tested, perhaps the most well-tested in the history of all of physics or maybe even science. I know I'm going on a limb saying that, but that just might be the case. Special relativity works. Special relativity says light does not get tired, so that's out. What's left? 
What's left is maybe the universe is expanding. Maybe that's it. Maybe the space between galaxies is getting bigger. Maybe it's not that all the galaxies are flying away from us. Maybe it's that all galaxies are getting further removed from all other galaxies. The entire universe is expanding. And that the redshift we see from distant galaxies isn't from the actual motion of galaxies flying through space, but from space stretching out. And so as that light travels from that distant galaxy, it gets stretched out like a piece of pasta or something. And that's what causes the redshift. And a further galaxy has had more space for that light to travel through, which means more stretching. This perfectly explains the relationship between distance and apparent velocity, where it's not actually velocity, but it's the motion, it's the expansion of space between us. It's entirely consistent with the results of Hubble's results. It was actually predicted before Hubble did his work. So years in the years leading up to Hubble's analysis, Hubble's studies, there were some uh, uh, proto-cosmologists and people who were getting started in cosmology, applying general relativity to problems of the whole entire universe, had kind of worked this out that we might live in an expanding universe. And here was the data. Here were the data, because data is a plural word. Here were the data that showed uh, it works. And so no other interpretation of Hubble's result holds fast. It just doesn't work. It either breaks something else we know about physics or breaks something else that we know about the observable universe. The only thing that's entirely 100% consistent fits with everything else we know is that we live in an expanding universe. And everything else, everything else that we know about the universe about cosmology, about the Big Bang Theory, about the cosmic microwave background, about nucleosynthesis, uh, the cosmic dawn, quasars, all of it fit into this same picture. And it's seeded by that very, very simple, raw observation of Hubble's that we live in an expanding universe. Thanks so much for watching. If you like the show, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. And uh, there's a bunch of stuff floating around my head right now. Just, just click on all of them.